Welcome back to our survey of the New Testament. In this video, we're we'll going to be looking at the Gospel of Luke. So starting off on our study here, uh, how does the Gospel get its name? Uh, well, reminder that none of the Gospels actually have their author's name attached to it. We still have pretty good authority of why each of the Gospels are called what they are. So what is the evidence for the Gospel of Luke being Luke's Gospel? Um, First, uh, while the book does not identify its writers, we just said, there is a fragment of the Gospel of Luke from about, stating around 175 AD to 220-ish AD. And at the end of it, um, it says, Angelion kata Lucan, uh, which means Gospel according to Luke in Greek. Uh, so from about the second century on, at least we have physical evidence that it was identified as Luke's gospel. Also, if we read many of the early church writers, such as Clement and, and Polycarp and some others, uh, they all speak with a unanimous agreement that the gospel, this one we're studying, is the one that Luke the physician wrote. Um, so what do we know about Luke the physician? Well, from Colossians chapter 4, uh, we know that he was not Jewish, he was a Gentile. Uh, he was Greek, which makes him the only um, right, New Testament writer who was a Gentile, uh, which is interesting. Secondly, we know he was a traveling companion of Paul, and we can read that in Philippians, uh, sorry, Philemon verse 24. Uh, also, I would encourage you to check out our survey on the book of Acts because we know there from about the middle of the book, Acts 16 or 18 there, that Luke then begins to speak in the first person, that he was with Paul and uh, saw the things that were going on. Um, and that's actually Acts 16 verse 40 and, and, and Acts 20 verses 5 through 6 are two examples there. So. What is the date of the Gospel of Luke? Uh, the Gospel of Luke um, and Acts are companions. They were probably written within a year of each other. Um, and because Acts ends with Paul's first imprisonment and not his execution, which his execution was in AD 66, we can say the Gospel of Luke, like Acts, was written sometime between AD 59 and AD 62. Um, that accounts for... Luke's conversion, him uh, traveling with Paul, having time to investigate everything, and then writing out his gospel and the, and the book of Acts, which um, for the first several centuries of the Christian church were treated as one unit, basically. You read Luke and Acts kind of together. They were together in, in the canons and so forth. Uh, so Luke's gospel, who's it addressed to? Well, if we look in chapter 1, verse 1, we read it's addressed to a, to a man by the name of Theophilus. Luke says in chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to read until verse 3, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus. Theophilus, his name means lover of God. It seems that he was a convert, a newer convert, and Luke was writing to him to give an account of the gospel so that he would have some sort of, you know, basis him to read over and over again to be sure of the things he was taught orally, as was the case in the first century. And so because of that, Luke's gospel is actually the longest gospel as far as verse length goes, uh, and it's, it's, the, it's in consecutive order. He, he wrote it out chronologically. Whereas Matthew and Mark, have, uh, sometimes their events don't always line up, and that's because they're telling it uh, with different purposes. As we said in our Mark video, it seems that Mark is kind of just recording things down as Peter's preaching them. And so Mark is kind of a compilation of sermons, if you will, if you want to think of it that way. While Luke is more of a historian investigating events and, and compiling a, a book about it, if you will. Um, so... Uh, the, the title Most Excellent Theophilus probably indicates that Theophilus himself was maybe a per person in authority. This term is used for other uh, individuals who are in authority. And so that's a little bit about the audience. But ultimately, as with the Old New Testament, it's been handed down for us today. So while its original audience is Theophilus, uh, its broader audience is all Christians and all who would read it uh, to learn more about Jesus. So without a doubt, the purpose then of Luke's Gospel 
is to, um, as stated in verses 1 through 4, which we just read, to give an account in consecutive order of the things accomplished among us, that is, the Christians and the work of Jesus, which is the same purpose uh, as the book of Acts, because the book of Acts is also written to Theophilus. It's part two of Luke's account there. Um, and Luke uh, presents Jesus as Savior to the lost, no matter who they are, uh, and he didn't limit this salvation to Jews only. We see that in the Gospel of Luke as well. In fact, I believe in uh, Luke chapter 24, Luke 24, and starting at verse 44 through 47, we read the words of Jesus. He says, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that, many, uh, that all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it was written, that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So we see Luke's Gospel emphasizes that, yes, Gentiles are welcome to God. This is part of his plan of salvation. So with that background in mind of the Gospel of Luke, what are some unique characteristics of Luke's Gospel? We want to cover uh, about four of them and give different examples of that, and the survey will be yours. Uh, the first one is the fact that he dates events. Luke uh, is a historian of the first rate. Uh, in fact, in, Roman in the study of Roman history, uh, the books of Luke and Acts are treated as trustworthy sources that no one questions their authenticity or their hi historiosity because of how accurate Luke is. Now, for us believers, that makes sense because he's inspired by God. But Luke pays very special attention to dates in the book. We're just going to give three for an example. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 5, he dates of about the year of Jesus' birth, or the time, roughly, of when this is all happening, uh, or at least as well as one could in the ancient world. So it says here in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of uh, Abijah, and he had a wife and the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Excuse me, that was dating about the time of John the Baptist's con conception. So we're told, a period of time in which these people are living, the days of Herod, and we're told um, who would have been the priesthood at this time and serving, uh, Zacharias. Uh, now, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So we were told went what emperor was ruling in Rome when this happened, and we're told w what governor was ruling in the province when this happened. Now, that's important to note, because Rome routinely uh, swapped out governors, and, you know, they, they changed hands, and there was different emperors, so this, this is able to allow us to date roughly when that thing took place, because he gives us the names of people who, and what offices they were in. Now, in chapter 3, and verses 1 and 2, we're told this, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of uh, Ituria and Trachodonius, and, Lys and Lysanus was tetrarch of a Abilene, and the high priesthood of, An of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So, not only do we have the year of uh, Tiberius Caesar's reign, um, but we also are told several individuals of what offices they were in and when they reigned. So, we're able to date when this revelation came to John the Baptist. So, Luke is unique in that, that he does give these very specific names, ranks, titles, you know, when they're serving the year, if applicable. So, Luke has a, pays a, keen eye, has a keen eye for detail as far as dates go. And this is because Luke, very likely, he interviewed all the eyewitnesses, or many of the eyewitnesses, who, who saw Jesus and, and heard him teach and, and so forth. And again, it's because Luke was a first-rate historian. 
We saw there in Luke chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, he investigated everything carefully. But if you want to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2 and verse 19, chapter 2 and verse 19, we read this. Uh, but Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. So how did, how did Luke know that? Could it be that Luke went out to the Apostle John, whom Mary was staying with, who she lived with, um, after Jesus ascended in heaven and, and talked to her and interviewed her? Um, now, if we look in verse, uh, the end of chapter 2, um, verse, uh, excuse me, here, 51, and it says here, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and he continued in subjection to them and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. So, again, how did how did Luke know that Mary treasured those things unless perhaps he interviewed her? Um, how would Luke know the inner workings of these people's minds um, about Jesus' childhood unless he talked to him? Now, I know uh, the Holy Spirit could have guided him and told him these things, but let's take into fact that, yes, Luke is inspired by the Holy Spirit because he has written inspired scripture, and we're going to see that in just a little minute. Uh, Paul quotes Luke as scripture, but also take in mind that the Spirit works through human agency, and so Luke investigated the things so the Spirit could be guiding him to make sure he investigates and interviews the right people. Um, regardless of that, we need to take the writer at his word, what he says in chapter 1. He investigated everything carefully. Uh, other unique features. For example, Luke is one of the two Gospels that begins with a genealogy. Matthews it has the genealogy uh, from Joseph. Now, why Joseph is not Jesus' physical father, um, Joseph would have been Jesus' legal father in, in terms of the Jewish law. So, Matthew traces Jesus' uh, uh, divine, excuse me, his uh, kingly lineage of the line of David through Joseph, and Luke, because m many would be saying, "Hold up, if he's if he's the son of God, that means Joseph's not in the picture. So how is he descendant of David?" Well, Luke take care. Luke Luke takes care of that for us. Luke traces Jesus' lineage back through Mary to David, but Luke goes further than David. Luke goes all the way back. Uh, to a to Adam, he goes back to goes from Mary to David to Abraham back to Adam to show the full lineage there, um, also to show us the, the the continuation of that seed promise that God made back in Genesis three fifteen, um, how the seed of a woman would crush the seed of the serpent. Um, also, Luke begins his gospel with showing fulfillment from Old Testament prophecy about concerning Jesus' birth. Um, now, this is interesting. Uh, before Paul died in AD 66, the Gospel of Luke was, in, Luke was in wide circulation, and Paul refers to it as Scripture. Uh, for example, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, and verse 18. 1 Timothy 5, verse 18, we read this. Now, he says concerning elders... Uh, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Okay, the laborer wor is worthy of his wages is a direct quotation, but from where? It comes from Luke chapter 10, verse 7. Luke chapter 10, and the verse is 7. Again, Luke chapter 10, and the verse is 7. We read here the words of Jesus. He says, stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Now, this is during the limited commission, in which Jesus sends out the 70 to go preach the gospel of the kingdom. But this is where Paul is quoting. He's quoting the words of Jesus as recorded in Luke's gospel. Which, and he's quoting that in conjunction with an Old Testament scripture, which he refers to as the scripture says, and he splices those two scriptures together, which shows Luke was in wide circulation and Luke was viewed as scripture. Um, also, a, a thing of in, interest for us to note as we bring this survey to a close on this book is that Luke emphasizes and shows how important prayer was in Jesus' life. I want to give three scriptures here 
uh, for us to consider. The first is Luke chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. And it says there, But the news about him was, was spreading even farther, and large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus himself would often slip away in the, into the wilderness and pray. So Jesus routinely sought out prayer as something very important to his life. We see in the next chapter, chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray. He spent the whole night in prayer to God. When day came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he also named as apostles. So we see before Jesus made a major life decision in his ministry, before he appointed the twelve apostles, he made sure to go to God in prayer about it, to ask for guidance. He spent all night in prayer about it. You know, we can mind ask ourselves, when was the last time we spent a long time in prayer before we made a major life decision? In Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 43, um, we read here, And he came out and proceeded as, it, and proceeded as his, was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and, he, and his disciples also followed him. And when he arrived at that place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, or appeared to him, strengthening him. The night in which Jesus was betrayed, uh, he spent hours in prayer, in steadfast prayer. He was asking if it was God's will to have this cup, this, this crucifixion be removed from him. But he said, not my will, your will be done. Now, these are not the only places in Luke's gospel to emphasize it, but it gives us a taste that God in the flesh, Jesus, routinely sought out prayer and showed how important prayer was in Jesus' life, which is another unique feature of the gospel of Luke. I hope this video was encouraging and edifying for you. I encourage you to check out the other videos in our New Testament survey, um, which you can find it on this playlist. Um, and if you're in the greater Tucson area, I want to invite you to come worship with us Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. We're at 145 North Country Club Road. The nearest cross streets is Country Club and Broadway in uh, Midtown Tucson. Uh, we live stream our service at 9.50 a.m. So if you don't live in Tucson, um, or you just want to see how we do things or hear the preaching before you come for in-person visit, we encourage you to make use of that live stream. We publish new content every Sunday evening and every Wednesday night as we continue our Bible studies uh, at those times. And as always, have a great week and God bless.